So in this last section, as I'm drawing this series to a close, I want to take stock of what we're really trying to accomplish and what we have been discussing to this point. What I hope I've given people is an outline for how to understand the culture war and interacting with institutions that are hostile to your own beliefs. Moreover, I hope I have also outlined an approach to taking on cultural institutions or opposing them that is a little bit more productive than the God is not dead model of just standing up and wearing your opinions on your sleeve and pushing back explicitly. But before I continue on to the last part where I broadly discuss how we can take a plan to push back against these institutions in a shorter term perspective and turn that into some kind of benefit in the longer term, I would like to examine what we really hope to accomplish and what we can really accomplish when we're interacting with institutions in the culture war. As I've said many times and earlier in this series, the culture war really is a war over education, over who can develop new minds. And as such, it's a longer term battle. Although it's fought in discrete interactions with institutions, everything that's done is done for the longer term. It's a generational struggle. And when we're talking about battles between fundamentally different ways of viewing the world, we're talking about a war that spans decades. As such, it's important not to overly exaggerate the role of any one interaction or any one institution in this culture war and in this struggle. The college classroom isn't the end-all be-all of the culture war. Neither is a city hall or an editorial board. But at any rate, perspective is needed. By no means should you ever do something dishonest or unethical to achieve these ends. If you fight for a cause like Christianity or Western civilization, you only be undermining your own cause in the long run. And as we take a step back in this way, we always have to see our own interaction with the culture war as being somewhat secondary to living actually good lives. And I guess it's this longer term perspective that really will bring this entire series to a head when we discuss how pushing back against cultural institutions can lead to long term gains for the cause you believe in. That's because I think one of the most important things we can take out of interactions with cultural institutions are in fact relationships, are in fact networks of people that we trust and with which we can communicate in the future. Now, of course, to a large degree, as I said previously, institutions thrive on narrative and optics, and creating situations where you get good optics is always important and will leave an impression on people who are observing the situation. However, Relationships will always last longer. In addition to being more meaningful, they also have more utility. And so that's probably where we can begin this last section. Now, a lot of what I said in the previous part of this series might have led a lot of listeners to believe that I think your entire interaction with any institution you disagree with should be to emulate the behavior of some thoroughly passive-aggressive gadfly. And while I thoroughly believe there are many institutions that really don't deserve anything more, this is not a particularly healthy attitude to take entirely. Because in your interactions with an institution, you should be constantly forming friendships and relationships at the same time. You're you're not doing anything dishonest. At most, you might not be bringing forth the full force of your opinion. But other than that, there's no reason why you can't be generally sincere and outgoing. It's really important to reach out to the believers of other ideologies. And you know, I don't mean the fanatics and the activists, which... I've already illustrated are pretty much beyond any kind of attempt at rational conversation. But for people who just believe in an ideology that you're opposed to, relationships help both people grow as more mature thinkers. And if any of us believe in the role of reason or truth even a little bit, that means something. In the last section, I pretty much gave a recipe for dropping a huge bomb into the middle of a cultural narrative. But of course, this shouldn't be overused. Once you've had the opportunity to make your views recognized, there's no reason why you can't reach across the aisle and be polite yet again to the people you oppose. A lot of the believers may observe what's going on in the institution and have second thoughts, have actual questions that they can't really get answered. Moreover, if you're mature in handling yourself, the professor or leader of the group might actually see you as an asset, as someone that he can actually have conversations with and learn something from. And from this point, we start entering into an environment that is less a fortress and more a forum. We start chipping away at the cultural chains of the last 30 years, where people of a non-progressive bent are totally locked out of institutions. Sure, it might be small, but it's a start. And here's where I think community can play a large role. 
and people begin to see that the existing cultural institutions are not good places to have conversations, then they'll be looking for somewhere else. They'll be looking for alternative institutions, alternative places of education, alternative ways of coming to truth, goodness, and beauty. And if you have contact with a truly good community, a learning institution that you yourself have developed to be more open, that you yourself have worked to make thicker, more developed, more honest, and with a more trustworthy network, then you're in a position to offer people something. And so the relationships formed in an institution, even a hostile institution, even relationships with people you might deeply disagree with, may be a path to forming new and better institutions as those of the old order slowly fall away and crumble under their own dishonesty. There's a dirty secret in academia as well as other organizations dedicated to the examination of the human condition and all elements of truth, goodness, and beauty. And that is that change occurs slowly, much more slowly than arguments are had or even won. Ideological change happens on a much broader scale than we like to admit to ourselves because it makes the the entire act of a dialectic seem almost futile, as if it's almost secondary. And of course, this makes the human individual feel small and insignificant. A lot of professors say that the only way truly revolutionary change comes is when there's a changing of the guard, when the old professors or institutions die away, either literally or figuratively, and are replaced by a new and up-and-coming generation. But yet, there's a slightly less cynical alternative, and that is the ideological change is slow, because it requires deep reflection that can come not from argument, but only through experience and relationship. The contemplation we need to truly change our minds is a very deep force. It's something humans themselves don't understand and may never fully understand. And as such, if we are seeking true ideological change, we have to go forward with this hope. We have to go forward with the understanding that we are not the drivers of that change, but rather facilitators, people who can, at most, set the stage for people to come to their own conclusions through reflection, through understanding their own community better. I think there is a lot that can be accomplished in this direction, as we work even with institutions that directly are opposed to us ideologically, and may even be hostile to our own ideas. And although the previous points I outlined are important to understand, and are important to shattering the mechanism of dishonest indoctrination, they're ineffective at accomplishing that most final task of bringing over your ideological opponent to being your ideological ally. This is a more complex spiritual transformation, and something that can only ever be facilitated in a spirit of friendly conversation. If there's something I absolutely do not want my listeners to take from this series, it is that I'm commending that we should embrace the culture of cynical indoctrination over the older form of civil discourse. At all times when we interact with these institutions, we should always be thinking of how we can recreate the older model of discussing things in a spirit of friendly exploration. That is the goal before all of us, and we should never lose sight of that. The tactics we have of optics and narrative should be tactics of clearing away the old, and we should never forget that there's a need to rebuild in the ashes. After all, at the end of the day, beyond the question of whose ideology is dominant, lies the much more fundamental, the much more human question of which ideology is true. And that is a struggle of much greater importance.